This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on June 12th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we're coming to you from Bellevue Medical Center. My guest is Director of the Division of Medical Humanities at NYU Langone Health and a professor in the Department of History at New York University. He's also author of the Pulitzer Prize winning book, which we'll talk about today, Polio an American Story, David Oshinsky. Welcome to Twitter. Thank you. Glad to be here. I last saw you at the Salk Centennial. That was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a number yeah. of years ago. That's right. Yeah. And that's where I got the idea to uh, have a chat with you. Well, welcome the to the East Side. It's, it's not easy to get I here. Know. Believe me. <laughs> I know. I wanted to first touch a little bit on your history, your, your education. Sure. Where are you from originally? You're, you're, I'm from Queens, okay. the, the, which was in... A real outer borough of New yeah, York. Yeah, which City. part of Queens? Regal Park, Forest Hills. Okay, so my wife yeah. is from Forest Hills. Good. I was. Metropolitan Avenue. Well, she was a little further out. <laughs> we used to say Forest Hills because it sounded uh-huh. a little glitzy. But Regal Park is the actual. Location. Regal Park is where I grew up. Uh, yeah. So I noted you had an accent. My wife has an accent too, as well. Damn proud of it. And you went to high school there? I did. I went to Forest Hills High School. Ah, I think she might have too. Oh no, she went to the Delahanty. Delahanty, you know, it's a Catholic high school. Okay, yeah, yeah. Bishop Delahanty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, and where did you go to college? Uh, Cornell. So I did too. You did? <laughs> yes. Well, you probably went a bit earlier than uh, I did. I'm sure quite a bit earlier. What year did you graduate? I, I graduated. I left Cornell uh, with a master's in '67. Okay. 1967. I arrived in 1970. I graduated okay. in 74. Right. Um, and I was a science major. What did, you had a master's in history? I, I did. I had a master's in history, yeah. Yeah, so already you, you were interested in history. By yeah, that time. yeah. I, th- I think that was where I was putting my money. At how, how, old, how early in your, in your life do you remember well, being interested? Um, I, it's hard to say. My parents are, were both school teachers. My father actually was a school principal in the public schools of New York City. And it was, it was a household where we did a lot of reading. Um, they were both uh, sticklers for grammar, mm-hmm. as I recall. <laughs> and um, I, one, of, one of the things I excelled at in school, indeed, one of, to be honest, one of the very rare things was uh, writing. I, I always could, knew how to write. And um, I wasn't good at math. I wasn't particularly good at science. Um, but I, I had... I was the kind of kid who would have um, sort of average grades, but I could always ace the SATs, sort of. So writing skills came in handy. All right. So you made you got a master's in history from Cornell. And what did you do next? Well, then I went to Brandeis and got a PhD in American history. Okay. You know, your door says MD on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. Um, and, uh, it's a mistake that they have made that I do not correct. And why not? Yeah, I right, exactly. I can park anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So Brandeis, uh, uh, PhD in history. Correct. And you must have specialized in some I did. Kind it was of mod- basically modern America. Okay. And it was a very small department, um, but a department filled with very prominent historians. And because we were a small group and, and it was pretty well funded at that time, um, and the job market was open at that time, everyone got a job and a number of people have really gone on to. Um, I, I am in a very small department. Uh, we had three people in a five-year period as students who would go on to win Pulitzer Prizes, which is very rare. What did you do after Brandeis? At uh, Brandeis, then I went to Rutgers, and I spent uh, probably about 25 years at Rutgers. Liked it very, very much. Raised our kids there in central New Jersey. And then uh, I think we both, my wife and I, Jane, when the last kid was out of the house, we had a kind of wanderlust, uh, <laughs> uh, basically uh, looking for or a chance to go to um, a university 
town that had uh, maybe a better climate uh, and, and a very different topography and a, and a different kind of culture. And I had friends who were at the University of Texas at Austin. Mm-hmm. I had always, as did my wife when we visited there, we always had a great time. It's one of these, right now it's about the hottest city in the country it in is. terms of people yeah. wanting to move yeah. there. Uh, but it always had this wonderful mix of kind of high culture, low culture. Mm-hmm. That, And I, I, I like low culture a little bit more, but I can tolerate them both. Um, so that and the beauty of Austin, the climate, great university. And um, at that time, uh, Dell had just headquartered there and Samsung and a lot of others. So it was this high tech area, bringing a lot of educated people. The state government is there. Um, so it really, we, and then we spent 12 years at the University of Texas and, um, and then we came back to NYU, uh, basically because part of me, I think, missed New York, although we were very well suited for Austin. Uh, we had grandchildren by this time, and so the poll was there. And uh, we there, a job opened up, which was a really interesting job, which would offer me um, half-time in the history department and half-time in the Department of Medicine. The Department of Medicine was looking to expand um, and to interest medical students in history, in bioethics, in uh, uh, all kinds of things related to narrative writing, reflective writing, and the like. So um, it was something that I felt I, you know, where I could make a contribution. And, and having sort of both universes and very different student bodies in the two places has really uh, been a lot of fun. So I live not too far from Rutgers. Where? I'm in Scotch Plains. Sure. You must know where that is. In fact, uh, some Rutgers professors live. A virologist, Aaron Shatkin, uh, oh, li- yeah. li- lives in Scotch yeah. Plains. He was my neighbor. Yeah. And Austin, I have, I know a lot of virologists at the university. Yeah, a, yeah. Last summer, we went there to record our 500th TWIV. Really? We were invited by um, some local virologists, uh-huh. and it was great. We had yeah. a nice room full of people. It's and great. It's, it was, it's really a I'm great I'm going place. back there next week. It's wonderful. And good yeah. barbecue, right? Very good barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> Among others, very, very good now, Mexican food. Over the like years, it. you've obviously taught. Right. Right. And you teach modern history, I, I suppose. I do. Um, actually, I, I've, my career sort of as a writer has moved from one subject to another. I started out in the Cold War and then domestic Cold War. Uh, my first big book was a biography of Senator Joe McCarthy. And then um, I got interested in the history of the South. And uh, my next book was on uh, crime and violence seen through the lens of Parchment Farm, sort of the great prison plantation in Mississippi. And then um, I was looking around for a, another topic, and um, I, it, I had always been interested in some degree in writing about things that I remembered as a child or caught my memory, and polio was one of them. Uh, I am uh, old enough so that I grew up in the era before the vaccines, so I knew what polio summer was like. Around every Memorial Day, it would sort of descend. It was the summer plague. And uh, you'd see box scores in the local New York newspapers uh, with the number of kids who had been admitted to polio wards in the city. And what you'd see, Vincent, is they would start to go up in June. They'd go higher in July. They'd peak in August, and they'd break after Labor Day, and the numbers would come down. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I remember very well, um, and we can talk about this later, uh, was not only the you know, the more minor things like closing swimming pools, no beaches, because the belief was that polio was transmitted through the water. We had to stay out of crowds because of the viral transmission. So that would mean no movie theaters, no going bowling. Um, rest was supposedly a big deal. So we rested more than any kid would ever want to. Uh, but what I do remember is coming back uh, in September to elementary school and you would see um, a couple kids in leg braces, uh, a couple kids in wheelchairs um, and and the occasional empty desk where you knew that child hadn't survived the summer. So those those were very, very powerful, very, very powerful memories. 
And um, it was also, in a way, as horrible as the disease was, it was a feel-good story because it was Americans uniting to defeat this insidious childhood disease and voluntarily raising the money um, to do just that. You know, there is no cure for polio. We have never found the cure, but we certainly did find the prevention. And so that's why this it's an American story, it polio is. an American story. Yeah, right? it's for, that, that, is, that is exactly the reason. Um, this was an era. I grew up in the, the 1950s as a very young boy. Um, there was no NIH money flowing to universities. Um, there was no big pharma that had this gigantic research apparatus to help. Um, all you had were voluntary organizations raising money to fund researchers for a specific disease. And polio becomes kind of America's national crusade medically. It's national obsession. And um, the, everyone remembers the March of Dimes, everyone from that era. Sure. They were the gold standard. So when roughly when did you start working on the book? I guess, uh, as I, I recall, my publisher... Um, wanted the book to come out um, in 2005, which would have been the kind of the 50th, 50th anniversary, yeah. really, of the, uh, when, the, you know, the, the great polio, the, the great experiment, the big, largest public exper- uh, uh, health experiment in American history occurred in 1954 with the salt trials. And then in 1955, polio was declared done with. Uh, <laughs> didn't exactly work out that way entirely, but, and we'll talk about that more, more in a bit, I'm sure, but they wanted the 50th anniversary to be, to have a book about it. So I guess I started working on the book around 2000. It took me about four or five years. One of the, uh, I won't call it a problem, but one of the issues with doing polio research is that you, the March of Dimes had a wonderful archive. Uh, right outside of New York City that I could use. But the the great polio researchers, uh, Jonas Salk, Albert Sabin, John Enders, they were scattered all the hell over the country. So Sabin's in Cincinnati. His papers are in Cincinnati. Salk's are in San Diego. A bunch of them are at Yale and Johns Hopkins and Harvard. So I had to go to many, many archives. And that it was fascinating, but it slowed the process down. Unfortunately, you never got to meet Either saw I did or not. They, they both they died. So, so yeah. I encountered both of them early in my career. Um, I was at a meeting where they were both present, and I established a correspondence with Sabin afterwards. Interesting. Um, and I have some amazing letters from him. I should show you one day. You would love them. Uh, I was at a meeting once. I was the chair of the session, and Sabin was there. And he talked a lot. He dominated. And Joe Melnick came up to me afterwards, Melnick, and he yeah. said... If you don't hold him back, he's going to dominate this whole meeting. And he's, you're telling me to hold safe. <laughs> I can't do that. So you, you didn't have a particular interest in medical history. No, this I was did just not. a story that no. compelled you, right? I, I did not. Uh, and that, that was what was interesting. I mean, what I wasn't really trying to write so much a medical history of polio is kind of a social history of polio. And by that, I mean, um, how, I mean, there is a lot of, you know, medicine in, in the book, but it really was how this country united to fight a disease, um, and did, and did it voluntarily. And of course, um, Salk and Sabin and others, this, if, if anything, this, this is a building block kind of discovery. There is no eureka moment here. Uh, you have Salk and Sabin just building on the research of numerous other people, almost all of whom have been supported by the March of Dimes. And, and, and each of them is working on his own vaccine. One is a killed virus vaccine. One is a live virus vaccine. They hate each other's guts. Um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis or the March of Dimes makes them play nice. They don't want to play nice, but, they're both being funded, and they do, they they play about as nice yeah. as they can. Yeah. Um, so, in that sense, it's a really, really interesting story, um, and it's a successful story. Sure. Um, and leading to today, where we're almost eradicating the disease we are. We've been using for, those we, vaccines. We've been, we've been on that. 
we've been, we've been sniffing that finish yes. line for quite a while. Well, you know, uh, I always tell people it's not the vaccines. The vaccines are good. They work. It's right. the wars and the exactly. social problems. that are Exactly. Stopping. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now, uh, on the cover of the book, it's, uh, there's another subtitle, The 20th Century's Most Feared Disease. Yet in the book, in the first few pages, you say, in truth, polio was never the raging epidemic portrayed in the media. So what made it that raging epidemic? It's an interesting story. And one of the reasons, just to uh, digress for a moment, one of the reasons you uh, needed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of kids to take part in this vaccine experiment is that polio is so rare that you need giant samples, you know, to test a vaccine and a placebo. Um, the reason is quite simple. Polio is an insidious disease. And you, you are talking about 40, 50,000 kids a year coming down with it in various forms, some mild, some serious, you know, very few would die of it, maybe a couple thousand uh, in, in a baby boom population, just an enormous uh, young population at this time. What happens, however, is, and I guess we'll talk a little bit about FDR uh, and the like, is that there is a foundation, the March of Dimes. And what the March of Dimes really does is to turn polio into America's disease. This, the scary part about polio is that you can be a hands-on parent, a hands-off parent. It doesn't matter. You cannot protect your child against polio. It is absolutely impossible. So every kid in the country is at risk. And that, right off the bat, makes parents extremely wary of, uh, of what is going on. And the other thing is that uh, the March of Dimes uh, really sort of changes the way we fundraise in the United States. And I think, I think it's, it's really is worth talking about that. I, I mean, you, you have a situation where until the March of Dimes comes into being until FDR really and Basil O'Connor get this thing going, if you wanted to raise money for a charity in the United States, say in 1925, you'd get a couple of very wealthy people together. And they would pool their money and then you would have the charity for unwed mothers at so and so or, or some disease. Um, what the March of Dimes did was to turn that on its head. You know, we don't want money from the few. We don't want big money from the few. We want small donations from the many. So uh, just give a dime. No one is too poor to give a dime to help a kid walk again. And it's an amazingly effective strategy because not only do they begin to get millions of small donations, but they get people like my mother who become March of Dimes volunteers. They will raise the money for the foundation. And every mother in my neighborhood was a March of Dimes volunteer. And the March of Dimes was also the first organization to use Madison Avenue. They, they, March Times is located in New York. This new 800 pound gorilla on the block was just forming Madison Avenue. And what you had was the March of Dimes looking to find new ways of advertising a disease. This was absolutely unheard of. And the March of Dimes is extremely effective. And one of the things the March of Dimes did, um, they were the first ones, for example, to use poster children. Poster children now, you know, very, very common. They were the first ones to have usually a little blonde kid walking into the sunlight, throwing his or her crutches down and saying, with your dime, I will be walking again. It was very, very effective. They were the first group to use celebrities. They started off by using celebrities, probably most people listening to this podcast never heard of, like Eddie Cantor. But they went on to use Bob Hope and Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley um, and the like. And what, one of the things that and every celebrity wanted to be associated <clears throat> with sort of helping children walk again. I mean, they were big hearted and also was great for their careers. Um, every year, the March of Dimes would hold these huge fundraisers around the country. And there is one photograph that really uh, I saw it in the March of Dimes archive that gives you a sense of their celebrity power. 
The Waldorf Astoria had given its main ballroom to the March of Dimes to raise money for polio. It's usually on the anniversary of FDR's uh, birthday. And in this photograph, <clears throat> you see Grace Kelly walking down the runway in a Dior gown. The music is being played by Rodgers and Hammerstein, and the backdrop has been uh, painted by Salvador Dali. And you just get a sense of the power of the March of Dimes in recruiting celebrities. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was incredible. So can we explore a little the origins of the March of Dimes, which, of course, is FDR? Mm -hmm. tell, tell us how that got going. Well, FDR um, was <clears throat> what you would call one of the older polio victims of his era. How old he, was he? 39. This, it's very old, yeah. This was a disease called infantile paralysis. Right, right. Although you will see the numbers do start to go up in terms of age. Uh, but it was unusual to have a 39 man, year man, uh, get, get polio. I remember, Vincent, when I was writing the book, <coughs> excuse me, my editor said to me, um, why did Roosevelt get polio? <laughs> and I said he was unlucky. His, I mean, he was, and, and she looked at me and said, you know, we're going to need, we're going to need more. More than that. Yeah, this is, this is not going to cut it. <laughs> so I actually did a kind of timeline for FDR where, um, put it to you this way. FDR grew up in Hyde Park on an estate and never played with other children. So it's quite clear that childhood diseases, viruses, bacterial infections that would affect others never got to him. And what you see with FDR was once he leaves Hyde Park to go to private school and then Harvard and Columbia Law, his life becomes like a medical encyclopedia. <laughs> he comes down with everything. Yeah. He almost yeah. dies during the uh, great influenza epidemic yeah. of 1918-1919 of pneumonia. Um, so he is, in a sense, a good target in that respect. And what also happens is interesting is that F FDR had run for vice president in 1920 on the Democratic ticket and had lost. It wasn't a good decade for Democrats. Uh, but he was a great campaigner. And Republicans were very worried about the fact that his future could hurt them. So what they did was they kind of demanded that Roosevelt come down to Washington in the brutal summer heat the year after he had run for office and to answer questions about homosexuality in the Navy. FDR, as some of your listeners might know, had been an assistant secretary of the Navy during World War I. And there had been this bogus investigation about various types of homosexuality in the service and how it was handled. Roosevelt was brought down in the brutal summer heat. Uh, he was humiliated. And there's no doubt in my mind that I think if you're talking about his, his immunity kind of went down at that time. His system was a bit suppressed. He was very, very anxious and he was depressed. And then he was going to go to Campobello Island, the summer residence, but he stopped off at Hyde Park and he attended a Boy Scout jamboree. And the last photograph that we have of FDR walking unassisted is at that Boy Scout jamboree with his arms around Boy Scouts. And then he went up to Campobello Island. He engaged in frenetic physical activity. He fell off his yacht into the Bay of Fundy, said, I've never felt water that cold. <laughs> He spent his afternoon in a wet bathing suit writing correspondence. You know what your mother said to you? Get out of a wet bathing suit. <laughs> it's no good for you. And he woke up the next morning with a full-blown case of polio, which would uh, paralyze him from the waist down for the rest of his life. So that sort of became my timeline. Once FDR got polio, he would then leave politics, and he basically spent the next six or seven years of his life trying to find a cure for the disease. And one of the things he did was to go down to Warm Springs, Georgia, where he thought the waters would help him. And he set up a foundation, the Warm Springs Foundation, which becomes the forerunner of the March of Dimes. In 1928, Roosevelt decides to go back into politics. 
Um, he is fully paralyzed from the waist down. And we can talk a little bit more about sort of the gentleman's agreement where the press did not go in that direction. Oh, uh, is that right? They, they, <coughs> they, they, he asked them not to. It was, a, to it do was that. an agreement. You were, uh, and, and those were the type of agreements you did. Mm-hmm. It was the type of agreement with John Kennedy's sex life. There were just things for politicians that were just out of bounds at that period. Nothing is out of bounds now. Today, it's yeah, all, I mean, it's it's all out of <laughs> But in those days, um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But FDR goes back into politics, wins the governorship of New York State, and takes his law partner, a man named Basil O'Connor, and says to him, Basil, I'm going back into politics. This is my life now, but I still want a cure for polio, and you are going to take over the National Foundation, the March of Dimes. And Basil O'Connor does that and really is the engine behind that. FDR is like Mr. Outside, raising money raising a ton of money for polio. And Basil O'Connor is setting up the organization that will um, basically find the two vaccines. Um, it's it's really <clears throat> quite remarkable. And just for one second, um, mm-hmm. there was a kind of gentleman's agreement. Uh, there are no photographs, maybe one or two that were taken privately, no public photographs ever of FDR in a compromised position, right. ever. Um, you would have cartoons of Roosevelt running and jumping. and uh, People knew he had polio, uh, but on the other hand, it was not seen as a disqualifier <clears throat> in any event, and people did not think of him in terms of being quote-unquote handicapped. It was, it was unbelievable. And I think that having polio, for, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt basically said it made her husband a more sympathetic figure. He, uh, he understood the suffering of others. And you know something, Vincent, having a disease like that <clears throat> is not the worst thing for a politician during the Great Depression. It's almost like the country was on its knees, uh, you know, and they now have a leader who is going to bring them back all the way. And, and Roosevelt, for the rest of his life, actually believed that he would... Um, he would somehow find a way to walk again. But when you see every time he's forgot, he'd have a blanket over his legs, which were very withered. Um, whenever he went to make a speech, there'd be arm rails, and he'd be surrounded by these very big Secret Service men who would sort of bring him to the podium. It was quite remarkable. Hey, I showed two photographs to my classes, one of him getting out of a car where... You can see his leg braces right. on, and another in a wheelchair yeah. with a with a young girl next to him. Yeah, and I say always, this this no one would be elected today who was paralyzed. Do you think that's correct to say? That's we talk about that too. I, I think it would be a little bit harder. I, I don't. I, I think if someone had <clears throat> a debilitating disease today, um, something like polio. I think that person could be elected president. I I think Americans might draw the line. If any are old enough to remember Tom Eagleton uh, when he ran with George McGovern, and it he ran for a very short period of time with George McGovern, but because it turned out that he had gone undergone electric shock treatment for depression, and McGovern said, "I stand behind you a thousand percent," (coughs) and then he was gone twenty four hours later. (laughs) So I think. I'm not sure if the disability were psychiatric. I think Americans might be more wary than if the disability were physical. I could be wrong, but that's... I think someone was just elected who is wheelchair-bound. Yes, we we have people in Congress now who lost their legs fighting in wars. Um, uh, Actually, Mitch McConnell, as a child, had polio. Uh, I don't know... I've never met him, so I don't know what it's like being ne- standing next to him. But he is a polio survivor. So, so you think most of the U.S. knew Roosevelt was paralyzed? Oh, but, I think so. But in the Depression, it didn't matter. And I think his I personality. Think it mattered, I think it mattered less. Yeah. I think it made Roosevelt a more sympathetic personality. It made him closer to the people. But it was not seen as a debilitating illness. They made Roosevelt and his inner staff made certain of that. And what is really interesting is that with very few exceptions, Republicans laid off. 
His critics did not go there. In the press as well, which is remarkable. Unbelievable. I mean, there's yeah. a quote in your book where he's leaving a, a voting booth and he says, boys, no photos. Yeah. And they, they listen. That's right. Would never happen today. No. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> Different climate. <laughs> Completely. Different climate. Yeah. So also, I think his personality helped a yeah. lot, right? Oh, yeah. A- absolutely. He was a, had a hugely magnetic personality. So he's really the reason we have two good vaccines against polio, and we're on the verge of eradicating it today. Yeah. It, he drove the whole <coughs> research. He, right? Well, Basil O'Connor, his, mm-hmm. the, the person he put in charge, did. Uh, the March of Dimes was a, a really good organization in that, on the one hand, it was a fundraising behemoth, which I talked about uh, a bit. The March of Dimes raised more money than every other American charity combined with the exception of the American Red Cross. And this was for a disease that afflicted far more, far fewer children than cancer or God knows how many other things. It was just that the advertising was so good and FDR's power was so strong. But, but we also have to understand that the March of Dimes financed a huge medical apparatus, a huge research apparatus. And they were revolutionary in what they did. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, they were the ones who figured out indirect costs that today, as you and your audience knows, is a lubricant <laughs> that keeps medical research going. <clears throat> um, the, the March of Dimes in 1940 gave a grant of about $50,000 to Harvard, to, to John Enders at Harvard. And to their astonishment, Harvard turned it down. And March and I said, why are you turning our money down? He said, well, it's very nice giving Enders 50 grand, but, you know, who's going to pay to light his lab? Who's going to pay to heat his lab? Who's going to pay for the Bunsen burners, the security, the monkeys, you know, everything that he needs? We can't do it. So what the March of Dimes did was to figure out a formula where they not only paid the grant, but they paid a very large slice of the indirect costs related to the grant, and that was revolutionary. The other thing the March of Dimes did, <clears throat> which I really tried to bring out in my book because they had gotten no credit for it before, is it was a huge research tent. And by that I mean that many of the breakthroughs in polio research were done by women. Um, Dorothy Horseman at Yale who figured out how polio traveled through the body. Um, they were, they were just, you know, absolutely extraordinary. The young lady at Hopkins. Right? Yeah. Um, Morgan? Isabel Morgan. Isabel Morgan. Yeah, yeah. Isabel Morgan, uh, by my calculation, was probably about 18 months ahead of Jonas Salk in a killed virus vaccine and uh, kind of at the height of her career in the late 1940s, she made the choice that women had to make in those days and to some degree are are wrestling with today. And that is she got married, she had a child, and she never got back into polio research, which is really absolutely extraordinary. But I think you can say that she blazed the path that Jonas Salk took to completion. So when you look at people like Horseman and Morgan, The March of Dimes really didn't care. Isabel Morgan had been working at the Rockefeller Institute. And her father, by the way, was a Nobel Prize winner. Isabel Morgan was underpaid. She had terrible lab space. She wasn't getting promoted. And she said, you know, the heck with this. So she joined the Hopkins, the Johns Hopkins polio unit, which was being heavily funded by the March of Dimes. And the reason they could hire her was with March of Dimes money, and she used that money very effectively, as did Dorothy Horseman at Yale. At a time when there was massive anti-Semitism in the medical community, the two largest grants went to Jews, Albert Sabin and Jonas Salk. So <clears throat> you have to look at the March of Dimes, and you want to think of an organization that went for the best people and sort of factored out what really is completely irrelevant, the March of Dimes did that. And this is Basil O'Connor's doing. It is. And, and a man named Harry Weaver, 
right. who ran their research. The, the, the March of Dimes was responsible. And the March of Dimes also, they had a virology committee um, of the best minds in the country. And they were relentless, absolutely relentless in this is what we expect of you when we give you a grant. And we're going to look at this very carefully. But your grant says, A, that we're going to have a typing and I don't mean, I, I don't mean typing on a typewriter. I mean, how many different types of polio virus are there? We have to know how many types there are. And we are going to hire people who are going to find out. Um, and that's how Jonas Salk basically got his feet wet in polio research. He got a significant grant from the March of Dimes to type polio virus. And fortunately for America and the world, <clears throat> polio virus is very stable. There are basically three types. And um, you could put all three types into a vaccine or at least give them separately. In your book, you, you write how the initial forays of the National Foundation into funding polio research didn't go well. Some vaccine efforts failed yes. because we didn't have the basic information that That's we correct. needed. And then they changed their approach. They Just did. talk about that. The first thing they did uh, was to, 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 to figure out, you know, who do we need to run this virology committee. And what they did was to get people like Tom Rivers, Thomas Rivers from the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, David Bodian from Johns Hopkins, Albert Sabin from Cincinnati, uh, John Enders from Harvard and Boston Children's Hospital. These were sort of the most important virologists. And to get them together and to say, you know, what is the program? What do we need to do? And the things they needed to do sort of to stop with this, all this hit and miss stuff, is one, find out how many types of polio virus there are. Two, figure out a way to grow enough safe polio virus to put into the arms of every child in America. And it was sort of John Enders who figured that that process out. And, what, and is the only polio researcher to win a Nobel Prize, by the way. And the third thing they had to do was to figure out, after all kinds of mistakes, how poliovirus traveled through the body. How did it get into the nervous system? And the belief had always been that it went through the nose, into the brain, into the nervous system. And if that were true, as you well know, a vaccine would be irrelevant because it never went through the blood. And Dorothy Horstman at Yale and David Bodian at Hopkins figured out that, in fact, poliovirus traveled through the mouth into the gut where it replicated and then into the bloodstream and then into the central nervous system. Therefore, a vaccine would work. I, I love the part where you, you talk. The, so they got Rivers, Tom Rivers, to join, and he made a list of 11 right. research priorities. Yeah. And number 11 was make a vaccine. I know. <laughs> I know. It, it was, it was, it really was, it really was quite extraordinary. It was almost like a big factory. You know, and everyone had his or her job <clears throat> and you had this this team overseeing it. And then finally, and, and, and one of the problems is, you know, you have some people who are working on a killed virus vaccine, some people working on a live virus vaccine. And at this time in the 1950s, the most virologists believed that you needed a live virus vaccine, that a live virus vaccine sort of replicated the infection and would produce the greatest amount of immunity. The problem was that you had a guy, Jonas Salk, working on a killed virus vaccine that was going to be ready a lot quicker. And kids were getting polio every year. So the quicker, the better. And <clears throat> in, in some at that time, in particular, a killed virus vaccine was safer because if it could be perfectly killed, um, there was no chance of the vaccine itself causing polio, where when you have an attenuated live virus vaccine, there is always that chance that the virus in the vaccine, no matter how attenuated, will revert to virulence. Of course, uh, Max Tyler had already made a yellow fever that is correct. vaccine, an infectious one. So probably that's what it influenced did. the thinking. Yeah, right? th that, that is right. And Salk, um, who is a, a brilliant uh, researcher, was kind of seen as old fashioned. And he was also seen as kind of a, a lapdog for the foundation. You know, every time the foundation needed to trot out a white knight in a lab coat, 
Jonas Salk was given that job. And I think there was a lot of blowback from the rest of the virus community that it is Johnny come lately gets in and has this vaccine that we don't think is that good. And he's getting all the attention and et cetera. So let's talk a little bit about Salk. Um, he had learned how to make a vaccine against influenza, right? right. That is with, was that with uh, Tommy Francis? Tommy Francis. Right. I always confuse him and Tom Rivers. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Tommy Francis. Yeah, I was at the University of Michigan. And uh, Salk was working on a, a, a killed virus influenza vaccine. So he was very familiar with the process. And that's one of the same flu vaccines we still use that today. That is correct. That is correct. It is exactly the same flu vaccine that we use today. Yeah. And then uh, how did the National Foundation discover Salk? Salk kind of made himself available to them. He was one of these young scientists who aggressively took part in the typing program. So they, and the typing program was, it was in a way it was seen by people like Albert Saban as Scott work. Right. You know, something you would give to a graduate student or a young researcher. <laughs> but what Jonas Salk did was to really take on this typing program virtually as his own and kept getting more money from the foundation and more researchers from the foundation and the like. So the, but by the time they figured out there were three types of polio vaccine, Jonas Salk had a factory going at the University of Pittsburgh. At this point, you start talking about the animosity of Sabin for Salk, and you've already touched on a bit to explain that because he thought the work he did wasn't particularly unique, right? Well, you know, some of it may be that they came from very similar backgrounds. Um, both came from that sort of Jewish cauldron of, uh, Sabin was born in Poland, but at a very young age came to the United States. They <clears throat> both were educated in public schools around New York City. Um, they they uh, both spent time at NYU. They both are graduates of NYU Medical School. Why did they both go there? Because NYU was probably the only place on the West Coast that did not have a Jewish quota. Harvard, Yale, Columbia, you know, Cornell all had a Jewish quota. NYU did not. So they both came out of this. Saul uh, was a bit younger than Sabin. So they have very, very similar backgrounds. And I think to some degree, it caused a, a bit of headbutting. The other was that Albert Sabin was a really established researcher. And he believed, you know, this young guy is coming in. He's not that good. Uh, he's working on an old fashioned vaccine. <laughs> and wait for me. I'm going to give you the best vaccine. Why settle for his? which has all these problems. He never quite said what they were. <coughs> um, and basically, Saban had the vaccine community on his side. You know, most people, I mean, Albert Saban was an amazing researcher, an absolutely amazing researcher. Um, and he had the power of the community behind him, and yet he was losing the race. And Basil O'Connor was the type of person who said, I want speed. Kids are getting polio every year. We have promised the public. They've given us money for decades. We promised them a vaccine. This guy's got one. It's coming down the pike. It looks like it's safe. Let's go with it. It drove Saban crazy. So so O'Connor wanted to back a winner, basically. He wanted to back the first, first guy. First one, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and Jonas Salk sort of knew that speed was important. And he was he was... Uh, the perfect person, much more so than Albert Saban, to go out in front of the public and calm them down, explain things. And he, right. he was the white knight in the lab. Yeah. Yeah. So by my uh, calculations, around 1951, Enders has found you could grow the virus right. now in cells. So then Salk really starts in earnest. That is correct. And then in 1953, he does something very unusual. He goes on the radio. Why did he do that? I think what it, what happens by 1953 is that Jonas Salk has now created a killed virus vaccine that is ready for human testing. And he has, you know, for a while they've tested it on monkeys, they've tested it on chimps, and now they've got to go and basically, if this is <clears throat> going to pass muster, they've got to do human testing. And what they want Jonas Salk to do 
<clears throat> is to sort of let the American public know that this is what's coming down the pike. Okay, and so then a big trial is planned. Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> so you've got to realize that um, <clears throat> it, it's it's real. It's almost hard to put this into words. Two million kids took part in a vaccine experiment where there was no guarantee that the vaccine worked. Salk knew it worked on monkeys and on a small percentage small of, of people. kids. Yeah. They had no guarantee how safe it was. And yet millions and millions of parents, including my own, threw the kids into line for this vaccine. And it gives you a sense of the feeling of risk versus reward that these people had in the 50s. They saw polio every year. They saw how devastating it was. And here was a vaccine that could do away with this. And to them, the reward so outweighed the risk that there was you know, it was, it was just nothing to it. A lot of these people have been giving to the March of Dimes for decades. Where is my vaccine? Where is my vaccine? <clears throat> I always tell the story of my own mother, a wonderful, very tribal woman. And I'm sure in the back of her mind, she was thinking, Salk's Jewish, we're Jewish. How bad could this be? <laughs> you know? uh, put all those factors together <clears throat> and the March of Dimes. And there was... Vince, there was a consent form. Mm -hmm. It was, it was a wild consent. It was more like, um, I am so happy to put my <laughs> child into a trial that will save children for generations and perhaps, you know, keep him or her from getting polio. It was, it wasn't one of these. I realized the risks. I thought nothing like that. So these, uh, they basically lined up about Two, close to two million kids. Some of the kids were just observed controls, nothing. Mm -hmm. For the rest, several hundred thousand were given three shots of the real vaccine, the real killed virus salt vaccine. <clears throat> and the other half of that non control group were given a look alike placebo. It was a double blind study. Nobody knew. Who, the, not even the caregiver, the nurse, the doctor, nobody knew who, who was getting what vaccine. Um, and it was really, it was, it was quite remarkable. And this was the era before computers, where all of this had to be done by, compiled basically by hand, millions of pieces of coded paper. And what is extraordinary is that Salk's mentor, Thomas Francis, was the man who ran the vaccine evaluation center at the University of Michigan to determine whether the vaccine was effective. I think it took a year to collate it all took, the data. Took over a right? year. That's remarkable. It took over a year to collate all the data. And then in the spring of 1955, the announcement was made that the vaccine is safe and potent and effective. And it, it was like a national holiday was declared. The, the newspaper the, headlines are remarkable. Kids were let out of school. <laughs> factory whistles went off. Church bells tolled. People were hugging each other in the streets. It was like a war had ended. It's amazing. In a way. It was. It was just one. It was. If you had to think of some of the greatest moments for medical science, <clears throat> this was one of them. Yeah. And this announcement was, as you say, a circus, really, because we've never done anything like that since to announce a vaccine nothing, result in such nothing, a big, big way. Nothing, and there were nothing feelings like were hurt. Julius Youngner was very insulted because he didn't give anyone well, credit. Uh, there was, um, so I'll talk about that very briefly. Um, <clears throat> when Salt got up to speak uh, in front of this giant crowd at the University of Michigan, he thanked everybody in the room. But he did not formally thank his own lab mates who were sitting in the front two rows. And um, he later claimed that uh, that an article was coming out in which their names would be on it. But or maybe he had a brain freeze. Whatever it was, it bro basically broke up the lab. And some of them never forgave him. They thought it sort of played into the notion of Jonas Salk as a glory hog. 
Right. I don't see Jonah Salk that way. It's hard to explain what was going through his mind and what happened, but it was, um, you know, one, one of the, the sad things about Jonas Salk, a brilliant man and a great humanitarian, is that he never really had a second success. Polio was it. Albert Sabin just went on, you know, working in the lab, never leaving mm. for the mm. rest of his life. So the vaccine is actually approved that very day, which is right. amazing. Yeah. And then problems occur. Yeah. Um, well, what, one of the, the problems was that when people in the study, you know, the polio pioneers got their polio shots. And what I will say, Vincent, is that people always ask, well, what are the people, what about the poor kids who got the placebo? They were lined up first the next year to get the real shots. Okay. But when they did the study, the great public health experiment, the vaccine had been triple tested. It had been tested by the government. It had been tested by the vaccine maker and had been tested in Salk's lab. So it was almost foolproof. As soon as word got out, my God, every parent in the country wanted his or her kid to get this vaccine now, not tomorrow, now. So what the March of Dimes did, it had a number of drug companies lined up to begin producing <clears throat> the salt killed virus vaccine, and um, it didn't have the same sort of triple mm-hmm. testing that had gone on, and it was it was done was much too speedily. And one of the labs, in particular, uh, Cutter Laboratories of Berkeley, California, uh, produced inactivated killed polio virus vaccine with live virus in it, and a lot of it. And one of the strains. One of the Salk strains, the Mahoney strain, the, the type 1 strain, was extremely virulent. So they start seeing, you know, they're giving the vaccine, particularly out in California, <clears throat> along the West Coast where Carter is, kids are coming down with polio. And they're coming down in pretty good numbers, you know, hundreds of them. A number of them die. And um, it becomes very, very clear that there's a problem with this one vaccine maker and uh, and the CDC sends out a unit, uh, which is amazingly effective in figuring out exactly what was going on and what the problem was. And Carter was, they stopped Carter immediately. And they stopped the vaccination for, you know, a period of, of, a, of a, a couple weeks. And then they, they had to restart it. And then they had to reconvince people that this was safe. And they've never had another problem with that vaccine since. So supposedly that began the product litigation it did. era mm-hmm. that we're now in big time, right? <laughs> it did. A lot of uh, a lot of big time attorneys yeah. made a lot a lot of big money um, off uh, uh, the, the 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 awful errors that were made at Cutter. Yes, in fact, uh, litigation, medical litigation. I think you can argue really does begin in large part. And the the other point that is probably worth talking about, and it's controversial, is that Julius Jungner, who is the second in command in Salk's lab, went out to Cutter Laboratories just as they were starting to produce the vaccine. And Jungner said it was a very sloppy operation, that there were all kinds of problems. And he went back and told Jonas Salk, he said, Jonas, you know, there's a real problem with Carter, and I think we've pretty much got to stop this. And uh, and Salk listened and said he would, and uh, and never did. This is Julius Youngner's story, right. but I will say that what Julius Youngner told me about many other stories all all seem to check out. Mm-hmm. Um, about this one, I really can't say, um, and I. It's 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 difficult to think of Jonas Salk um, doing that yeah. in those terms. Yeah, I interviewed Julius not long before he died, and he said the same thing. Yeah. So, but well, he's consistent with his story yeah. anyway. But who knows, right? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. So the vaccine is restored. It's used for a number of years. Polio right. numbers drop. But in the meantime, Sabin is moving right. Well, the Alpha Sabin is chugging along, um, and because so many kids have received 
the polio vaccine, it's the soft vaccine in the United States. Saban has to go elsewhere to test. Mm -hmm. So one of the great stories of the Cold War, um, Saban goes to the Soviet Union and a couple of East European satellites <coughs> and tests his live virus vaccine. And Vincent, we're, we're not talking about small studies and volunteers. I mean, kids are just lined up by the millions. Even bigger than the U.S. Oh, trial, but right? there's no comparison how big <laughs> it is. And, and, and you get these, these funny, you know, letters from Albert Saban. He's writing home. He said, God, he said, I love doing clinical work here. He said, you tell people to show up Thursday at 10 o'clock and there they are and the <laughs> line goes on. Well, it's the Soviet Union. Um, and he came back with amazing results. Results that in some ways may have been even too good to be true. Um, but within a very short period of time, uh, the Sabin live virus vaccine kind of sweeps the field and pushes Salk's vaccine out. And what you see, the numbers say were about 40, 45,000 getting polio in 1955 with the Salk vaccine. They're going down and down <clears throat> into the low thousands. And then with the Sabin vaccine, they, they're like 10, 12, 15 kids a year getting polio. It's almost like polio has been eradicated. The only problem, as you know, is that every one of these cases of polio is vaccine induced because with a live virus vaccine, an infinitesimally small percentage of those getting it will get full-fledged polio. Albert Sabin never admitted to it, never I know. would he, believe he it. it always, uh, yes. Yeah. Even when mo the molecular techniques showed that it was clear it was his vaccines, he wouldn't, he wouldn't yeah, believe no. it. But it was, it, was, it was hard. That's why the Russian results are interesting. Now, Dorothy Horstman reviewed them. Yes. She said it was fine, but I'm surprised they didn't see vaccine-associated polio. I, I, I think I think they probably did. And didn't report And it. just wasn't reported. Yeah, it must have been. Dorothy Osman was as honest as the day is long. She was also very friendly mm -hmm. with Albert Sabin and may have been more likely to accept his version of events. I've, I've been involved in a few trials of children and parents who, who contracted polio from the vaccine and are suing the company to get some some uh, compensation. And some of the arguments the lawyers use is that we should still be using Salk vaccine. We never gave it a chance, and this wouldn't have happened if we well, we've gone back to Salk's vaccine. Of course, now we have. Right, yes. Yeah. But uh, but you're absolutely right. Um, there were many people in the scientific community who were saying, <clears throat> if we can get a stronger, juiced up version of the Salk vaccine, uh, why not? Go back to it because it's perfectly safe. Uh, the point is that, um, and the other thing is that Sabin's vaccine is cheaper and it's so easy, much easier easy. to give. Totally, my yes. God, it's just a sugar cube or a you know yeah. a little squirt yeah. on your on your tongue as opposed to needles. Um, so there's a, there's really a big difference that way. But you're absolutely right. Um, and finally, in the 1990s, you know the AMA and pediatric societies force the issue. Yeah. And in America today, we do use the salt vaccine. We do. And yeah. that's the right decision. Because it is. You cannot... not, not, in, not in developing parts no, of the world. But yes. No, the eradication yeah. has used largely Sabin vaccine, although now yeah. WHO is realizing that we yes. have to have a shift globally to SALK, which exactly. is remarkable. It is. That, that is. is. You know, what is so interesting about this is that both of them would turn over in their grave having to realize that it's going to take both vaccines to That's end right. polio. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Absolutely. And neither one knew of any of this. Exactly. They both died before these things happened. But, of course, Salk fought bitterly uh, against the introduction of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. But there will be a time when uh, we don't have mm -hmm. any polio left. We'll be using just Salk vaccine, and then we'll be able to stop yes. vaccinating. It'll happen. It'll, it'll happen. As you may know... Um, there, there are people in the public health community who feel that um, polio is largely contained now. In other words, it's in three countries, and the numbers of polio victims per year are now f in double digits, like 75, 13, 40. So why do we have to keep spending billions upon billions of dollars uh, when it could be spent better elsewhere? And I guess, you know, there are, there are many arguments on the other side, which I happen to support. 
One is only one human disease ever has been wiped off the face of the earth, and that's smallpox. And we haven't had to vaccinate since the 1970s. So we can imagine the amount of money to financially that we have saved because of this. Um, it's also the, the notion of momentum that ending this disease would just give the scientific community and the vaccine community so much momentum. And my feeling is um, when you have two vaccines that are this good, it's kind of morally unacceptable not not to use them to get that, that, that last case. I, I would agree with that. And I do think we need to keep vaccinating until the wild strains. Right now, it's mostly yes. type 1. That's right. Circulating That's right. Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. That's it. Yeah. If we can stop it, but we can't in other countries because these viruses move silently, That's as correct. you know. And you that, that is, That's one of the difference between smallpox and, and, and right. polio. Right. That polio is, a, is, is really a silent carrier. But we're close. I mean, we are, we are really close, as you said. It's those three countries. Um, and as you also said, these are countries where there's tremendous, tremendous social dislocation, terrorism, wars, and the like. On the other hand, India is now polio free. How amazing is that? That India, it doesn't have some of the problems, but, but look at the logistics sure. of India and it's now polio free. That shows it can be done yeah, globally. It can be done. Because that was such a difficult country yeah. to do That's that. Right. Yeah. So this is a remarkable story for me as someone who worked my whole career on polio, it's remarkable. But for everyone else, it's a wonderful story because it's not just about science. It's about these individuals who propelled it. It is. Is there anything else like it in medicine that you know I can, of? I can, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, toot that horn, but it does have to be tooted in, in the sense that it's a very unique story. This is a story <clears throat> in which Anxiety and fear on the one hand, but voluntarism on the other hand, pure voluntarism without government action, without big pharma, without great universities at this time. This was the March of Dimes, was the funding engine. It did things properly. It got the right scientists. Each scientist had a role. Each provided a building block. And Salk and Sabin basically used those building blocks to produce two remarkably good vaccines. And one of the things that's interesting, Vincent, is that for a while, the March of Dimes did think of patenting mm-hmm. Salk's vaccine. But it turned out there were so many people involved with those building blocks that it was impossible to, to do, do it. it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I know that Salk said, how could you patent right. the sun, right? Right. <laughs> Exactly. And I think there was a book of that name yes, also written yes, about this. Right, yeah. And there have been other vaccines since, and none have involved the same kind of stories as this one. That's correct. Um, I, I mean, you know, I'm, th- there's fascinating stuff <clears throat> regarding Ebola and certainly um, the, uh, the the developments in the drug industry uh, and the like with HIV are are quite extraordinary. But um, one of the beauties of polio was that, in the end, it turned out to be a relatively easy disease to find vaccines for once you knew what you were looking for and once everyone was given a kind of job. And it all came together as a collectivity. It was funded nationally. Um, it's in that, in that sense, it's just a really feel-good story. The only thing I would say um, in ending is that there still are hundreds of thousands of polio survivors out there. Um, there are fewer of them every year because we're getting all getting older. Uh, and they have had recurrences of not polio itself, but muscle illnesses and the like, uh, up kind of post-polio syndrome. And, and we mustn't forget that along with everything that Salk and Sabin did to save the future of the children of America, we also have, um, we still have hundreds of thousands of living polio people, polio survivors, and they must not be forgotten. Some still in uh, iron lungs, in fact, remarkably. <laughs> there, there are, and they're not, you know, they're not producing parts for iron right. lungs now. Um, 
it's a uh, it's a remarkable as it really is a, in that sense a remarkable story yeah my guest today has been david oshinsky author of polio an american story i highly recommend uh, you go out and read it it's a wonderful story thank you so much for my joining pleasure me, david. thank you i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.ws i want to thank asv and asm for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.